welcome or welcome back uh, to the third in our series of Rare Book School online lectures, Textual Connected Histories and Global Legacies. Uh, my name is John Pollock and I am with, I am speaking from Philadelphia and with Roger Chartier, who is speaking from Paris, uh, managing the production behind the scenes are our colleagues from Rare Book School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, today's lecture is entitled, as you can see, Global Cervantes, and we hope to take you on a grand tour. Um, but before we do, I just want to uh, too briefly uh, give some acknowledgments and thanks. Um, we'll say a thank you again at the end, but um, this is a, a strange and difficult and stressful year for many of us, uh, all of us, uh, as we know. Um, but we're very grateful to the Rare Book School for creating a sense of shared community um, around books and bibliography, even in these difficult times. Um, and Roger and I were joking that um, it's been almost as intense a feeling of uh, productive work as if we were actually together uh, in a classroom for a week, which, which of course we're not. But um, so we'd like to thank, um, I'll just name a few of our wonderful colleagues at Rare Book School. Um, of course, Michael Suarez, the director, um, friend and colleague for so many years. Barbara Heritage, uh, also friend and colleague for many, many years. Um, colleagues we've worked with more recently, Vanessa Evers, Somme Lewis, um, and in particular for helping us manage the logistics of this series. Um, folks who are, again, pulling the levers behind the scenes, Ruth Ellen St. Ange, Laura Parings, Laura Item, um, and special thanks to Camille, Camille Davis, um, longtime friend and colleague, both at Penn and at Rare Book School. So we thank you all, we thank the entire Rare Book School team, um, and we thank you, the audience, for uh, listening in and sending us your good questions and observations. And with that, um, global Cervantes, Roger. Okay. Uh, according to Franco Moretti, I quote, literary geography can refer to two, very, to two different, uh, very different things. It may indicate the study of space in literature or else of literature in space, end of quote. The second perspective, literature in space, considered the book as a commodity, une marchandise, to quote Fevre and Martin. And it maps the places of publication of the work and the chronology of its translations. The first perspective, space in literature, maps the geographical settings of the plots, the travels of the characters, the places of their encounter. It does not deal with the historical space of the circulation of the books, but with the fictional spaces within the narrative itself. It is, it is within this double perspective, historical and textual, that we would like to locate Cervantes' geographies. In chapter three of the second part of Don Quixote, published in 1615, Don Quixote asked the bachelier Sanson Carrasco, who is just returning from Salamanca. So then, is it true that my history exists and that it was composed by a wise moor? It is so true, senor, says Sanson, that I believe there are more than 12,000 copies of this history in print today. If you do not think so, let Portugal, Barcelona, and Valencia tell you so for they were printed there. There is even a rumor that it is being printed in Antwerp. The figure of 12,000 copies of Cervantes' book put on the market between 1605 
date of the first uh, edition and 1615 date of this text is completely plausible given that by the later date, 1615, nine editions of the book had been published, three in Madrid, two in 1605 and one in 1608, two in Lisbon, both in 1605, one in Valencia in 1605, but none in Barcelona, one in Milan and two in Brussels, but not Antwerp in 1607 and 1611. This geography is a geography of the territories ruled by the king of the composite monarchy that associates the crowns of Castile, Aragon, and since 1580, Portugal. Whereas the privilege given by Cervantes on September 26, 1604, was only valid for Nuestros Reinos de Castilla, our kingdoms of Castile, a privilege for Portugal dated February 2nd, 1605, was added in the second edition printed in Madrid. And the same day, a privilege for Aragon was given to Cervantes by the Viceroy of Valencia. These new privileges allowed the publication in the year 1605 of the two editions of uh, Lisbon, and you can see one of them with this uh, your, your licencia of the, the Inquisition, and uh, also the publication of the edition printed in uh, uh, Valencia. According to 17th century printer's manual, such as the Institución y Origen del Arte de la Imprenta, composed around 1680 by Alonso Victor de Paredes, the average press run for an edition was 1,500 copies, between 1,250 or 1,750. This means that there were probably some 13,500 copies of Don Quixote in Castilian circulating in the 10 years that followed the print caps edition printed at the end of 1604 in Madrid with the date of 1605 in the printing shop of Juan de la Cuesta for the bookseller Francisco de Robles. Sanson Carrasco added, and it is evident to me that every nation or language will have its translation of the book. Indeed, two translations of Don Quixote had already been published before the publication in Spanish of the second part in 1615. In 1612, the English translation by Thomas Shelton, and in 1614, the French translation by César Houdin. The second part of the work was first translated into French by François de Rosset in 1618, and then in English by Thomas Shelton again in 1620. The Italian translation followed this shortly, 1622. The German one was printed in 1648, but only with the 23 first chapters of the first part. And the Dutch one was published a little later, 1657. As shown, as you can see on the screen, by one of Moretti's maps, a second wave of translation occurred in the peripheral, peripheral and enlightened Europe between 1769 and 1802, with the translation in Russia, Denmark, Poland, Portugal, and Sweden. The third wave, as you see on the map, between uh, 1813 and 1896, wa took place uh, in a wider space and was contemporary of the affirmation of national identities. It led to the translation of Don Quixote in the different languages of the territories that composed the empires, Ottoman Empire, Habsburg Empire, Russian Empire, and also in Asia with the translation of Don Quixote into Chinese, Persian, Hindi, and Japanese. In Western Europe, the first translation must not hide an important phenomenon, the publication 
in the late 17th and the 18th century of new translation of a work already translated, either because the new translation declared taking into account the transformation of the language of the translated text, or because they affirm that uh, the translation was done from a true and original text or from its best new edition in Spanish. For the English Don Quixote, the series began in 1687 with John Phillips. We met John Phillips yesterday because he had also translated uh, some years before the uh, Brevissima Relation uh, of Las Casas. As you can see, the text is presented as new made English according to the humor of our modern language, as if the distance between 1612 or 20 and 1687 was sufficient to claim that uh, there is a modern English language. Philip's translation was followed by five other translations that claim to be revised and corrected. Motus translation in 1700 is given, as you see, as translated from the original by several hands. Stevens translation published the same year, 1700, is presented as a new edition of Shelton's translation, now revised, corrected, and partly new translated from the original. Ozzard's translation in 1719 is said carefully uh, revised and compared with the best edition of the original printed in Madrid. Whereas Jarvis translation in 1742 and Smollett's translation in 1755 both claim to be translated from the original Spanish of Miguel de Cervantes. We could say that with this multiple translation, six between uh, 16, uh, 1687 and uh, 1755, that uh, the uh, Don Quixote became perhaps the most popular English novel of the 18th century and became a book that deeply transformed the horizon of expectation, both of its reader and of the writers. It is the reception of Don Quixote that made possible the novels written by Fielding, by Smollett, translator himself, or by Stern. And here we thought we would just allude briefly to the fact that throughout the presentation, you will see um, representations of some of the collections at Penn at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and there are in fact other copies of other texts that we own that I was not able to photograph. Uh, the uh, Cervantes collection uh, of editions at Penn is, is, is quite significant. Um, I should mention that uh, the university does not own uh, any of the any copy of the first edition, the very first edition, famously, is held at the Rosenbach Museum and Library, now part of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, another 1605 edition uh, is uh, held by our good friends at Haverford uh, University Special Collections. Our earliest edition at Penn is 1607 Brussels. You saw that go by quickly. 1608 Madrid follows, um, but one of the other points that um, is easier to make physically, but we'll make it digitally nonetheless, is that our 18th century English collections are very significant, and that actually allows us to represent the much longer ongoing history of the Quixote, particularly, as you can see on the screen, as it made its way into England. Following this topic of the new translation of a text already translated, we can consider the case of France after the case of uh, England. In France, 
the first translation by César Roudin for the first part and uh, Rosset for the second one had a longer resistance in spite of the new translation by the Jansenist Fio de Saint Martin, 1677-78, in which Don Quixote did not die at the end of the second part, allowing the uh, translator to write his own uh, second. And the uh, translation by Florian, published after his death in 1799, that abridged radically the work by suppressing what Florian designated as, I quote, repetition and digression to the banal, and by, I quote, drastically compressing the narration. Those French new translation were not so successful as the English one uh, in the 18th century. Uh, however, were often used for the translation of Don Quixote in other language. The case of the Russian translation illustrates this frequent phenomenon of translation of translations. The first Russian translation printed anonymously in 1769 was a translation of Fillot de Saint Martin translation, as was the second one published by Nicolas Lozipo in 1791. The following one, Vasily Zukovsky translation in six volumes published between 1804 and 1806, was a translation of Florian's translation. It is only in 1838 that Konstantin Masalski translated Cervantes' book directly from Spanish. Edition and translation are not sufficient, however, for drawing the cartography of the circulation of a work and the afterlife of an author. Other geographies and cartographies are necessary. And in first instance, the mapping of the places and dates of the various embodiments of the fictional character. It was very early on that Don Quixote and his companions emerged from the pages that told their adventure and made their appearance in courtly festivals, religious celebrations, popular masquerades. In 1608, on the occasion of the entry of the Duke of Lerma, the Balido of Philip III, into the town of du Tudela del Duero, the corrida that took place in the square in front of the town hall included, I quote, the Aventuras de Caballero Don Quixote. One year earlier, in 1607, the knight crossed the Atlantic, taking part with other famous chivalric knights in the just organized by the Corregidor of Paosa, that was at the time the small capital of the province of Paranicochas and Peru. One of the competitors had chosen to appear according to the relation of the event as the Caballero de la Triste Figura, Don Quixote de la Ancha, como lo pintan en su libro, as he is depicted in his book. Indeed, the book of Don Quixote was certainly not unknown in the Spanish Indies. Even if the claim made by Irving Leonard that who affirmed that close on the whole of the first edition was dispatched to America, and even if this claim seems somewhat exaggerated, the fact remains, however, that a very large number of copies of the Historia had arrived in Mexico and Peru by 1605 or 1606, either because the transatlantic book trade between Spanish booksellers, particularly in Alcalá de Henares and uh, the colonial booksellers, or because some transatlantic travelers brought the book with them. Cervantes' heroes remain familiar figures present in many festivals in Spain. For instance, in Salamanca in 1610, during the festivities celebrating the beatification of Ignatius of Loyola, the students performed a picaresque masquerade devoted to El Triunfo de Don Quixote. This comic triumph of Don Quixote, performed at the heart of the religious celebrations, was enjoyed by all the spectators, but 
as the report of the festivities notes, in particular by, I quote, those who had read his book. The formula that combined the pleasant presence of Don Quixote and the devout prayers addressed to recent and new saints, Ignatius of Loyola or Teresa of Avila, was a feature that reappeared in Saragossa in 1614, Cordova in 1615, Seville 1617, Baeza and Utrero 1618. Likewise, on the American continent, in Mexico in 1621, the knight errant was present in the festival organized by the workers of the Royal Mint on the occasion of the beatification of San Isidro. The stages proposed another form of embodiment of the heroes of the fiction. Before Pamela, before Paul et Virginie, Don Quixote, Cardenio, and other protagonists of Cervantes' book became dramatic characters. In this case, the geography of the theatrical adaptation followed the chronology of the edition and translation. Very soon after the publication of the Historia, possibly in 1605 or 1606, the Valencian playwright Guillén de Castro composed the Comedia in three acts entitled Don Quixote de la Mancha, which in fact fundamentally staged the love story of Cardenio and Lucinda. During the early months of 1613, the King's Men in London performed before the Court of England a play entitled Cardeno or Cardena, according to the different sources, which is without any doubt the first English theatrical adaptation appropriating the novel with quotation mark of Cardenio, and perhaps also we don't know the history of the knight errant himself. In the last 15 years, the quest for this lost play, the Cardenio of 1613, became, as you know, perhaps a good plot for detective novels, a challenge taken by many playwrights and stage directors, and an academic copious industry to which, unfortunately, I have myself contributed. I do not want tell, to tell again, I, do, I don't want to tell once again a well known and perhaps worn out story. I just want to come back briefly to the documents of the 17th century that indicated the presence of Cervantes' book in England and associated it in a manner or another with Shakespeare. It is in 1605 that Cervantes' book, Don Quixote de la Mancha, entered into the Bodleian li Library. Apparently, it was purchased in Spain by the London bookseller, John Bill. Bill had been sent in Spain by Sir Thomas Bodley <coughs> for buying books using the donation of 100 pounds made by the Earl of Southampton for the acquisition of Spanish books by the library. As shown by the benefactor register of the library in 1605, Cervantes' book was probably received in August of this year, which explains why it is not mentioned in the earliest catalog of the collection. Another copy was surely brought to England by Dudley Carlton, one among the gentlemen who had accompanied the Earl of Nottingham during his embassy in Spain in the spring of 1605. In a letter sent to his friend John Chamberlain on November 1605, Carlton wrote, you can read, whilst I was in Spain, I bestowed much in books because they are, are rare of that language in England. The following year, in a letter dated on May 11, 1606, he wrote to Chamberlain, I send you Don Quixote, Don Quixote Challenge, which is translated into all languages and sent into the wide world. The allusion remains uh, obscure. We do not know which challenge Dudley Carlton had in mind. And in 1606, Don Quixote was not yet translated in any language. But the hyperbolic remark can take place within the corpus of the first English references 
to Cervantes uh, Historia, and particularly the use of the expression to find with the windmill. It is certain that Don Quixote, the book and the character, were present in England early as 1605. Did Shakespeare meet them? To document subjects, it was perhaps the case. The first one is an account prepared for the, the treasurer of the chamber that registers two payment to the company of the king's men. Dated on May 20th, 1613, this warrant ordered the payment of 60 pounds by way of his majesty's reward to John Eming and the company of the king's men for having performed at the court six plays during the previous months. Among them, is a play of which the title is given as, I say this, Cardeno. One month later, on July 9, another six pounds, 13 shillings, and four pence are paid to the same John Eming, I quote, for himself and the rest of his fellows, his majesty's servants and players, for the performance of a play called Cardena, performed before the Duke of Savoy ambassador who had been the guest of the English court. We can assume that the play was the story of Cardenio, who exchanges wolves of marriage with Lucinda in Cervantes book, and was betrayed by his friend, Fernando, the uh, son of the Duke. The, seg the second document is a register of the writing copy of the Stationers Company. And we have a reproduction of this here. On September 9, 1653, 40 years after, the Royalist bookseller Humphrey Mosley entered for his copy 42 plays. As you can see at the bottom of the document, the tense is entered as the history of Cardenio by Master Fletcher and Shakespeare. The mention of the collaboration between the two playwrights for the history of Cardenio is plausible. During the year 1613, they wrote together two plays, All is True, published in 1623 folio as The Life of Henry VIII, and The Two Noble Kinsmen, published with their two names in 1634. Cardenio may have been the first play of their three collaborative works, since the play was likely performed, as I said, in January or February 1613 at the court. But with the history of Cardenio, would it really meet Cervantes' book? Shakespeare or Fletcher? Fletcher, whose name is first attached to the play in the register of the Stationers Company, knew Spanish and was much more familiar than Shakespeare with Cervantes' work. And he used all the uh, Cervantes' book in different places before and after the uh, Cardenio. Remains, however, a possible clue of Shakespeare authorship in the play registered in 1653. Its title itself. As observed by Gary Taylor, the formula, the history of, occurs in six plays by Shakespeare before 1613, from Hamlet to King Lee, or from the uh, Merchant of Venice to Gatrolis and Cressida. None of the Fletcher plays use this formula, the history of, and no other playwright used it so frequently in the title of his plays. Shakespeare was perhaps confirmed in this uh, uh, test for this formula by the title of Shelston's translation, The History of the Valorous and Witty Knight Errant Don Quixote of the Mancha. Shelton added to the Spanish title, El Ingenio Su Hidalgo Don Quixote de la Mancha, the term history, the history of, accepting a genuine the fiction of the adventure of Don Quixote. He substituted to the word Hidalgo, the word knight errant, as if the reader, or most of them, already knew the story 
of the poor gentleman who decided to become a knight errant and to call himself Don Quixote de Arancha. The implied knowledge of the history of the witty, translating Egeioso, and valorous, a word added by Shelton, this uh, witty and valorous uh, gentleman was reinforced in the new edition of the 1612 translation that Brown published in 1620. At the same time, he published the second part, the translation of the second part. The frontispiece, as you can see on the uh, uh, left, used the engraving that Blount borrowed from the French translation of the second part in 1618. And the two digital copies of the 1612 edition available in early English books show this frontispiece for the 1612 edition announcing with a kind of weird French uh, 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 spelling of Don Quixote, the first part of a book that in 1605 uh, 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 and in 1612 uh, 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 translation had not a second part at this date. This woodcut is the first image that portrays the two characters and that begins a tradition that transform the episode of the windmill, you can see in the back, in a synecdoche for the entire book. We cannot observe also that Cervantes is mentioned neither on the title page nor in the preliminary. Why? Because everyone knew who was the author of Don Quixote, perhaps or because the genre of the book did not require any authorial attribution or authority. In his dedicatory episode to Lord Walden, Shelton, the translator, promised him, I quote, to produce in time some worthier subject. In France, Don Quixote appeared also in courtly festivities for example, two ballets in the Louvre in 1614 and 1620. But it appeared also on the stages, like in Spain and in England. The first French play based on Don Quixote, written by Pichu, was performed by the company of the Hotel de Bourgogne in 1628 and printed, as you can see, in 1630. Pichu's choice was similar to the one made in London in 1613. The title of his tragic comedy was Les Folies de Cardenio, as was the history of Cardenio in England. Even if in this case, because we have the text, we can be sure that Don Quixote and uh, Sancho appeared in the play and uh, on the stage. 10 years later, another French playwright, Daniel Guérin de Bousquer, based three plays on Cervantes' book in 1639 and 1640, the two parts of his Don Quixote de la Manche. And we have on the screen, in 1642, the third play, the Le Gouvernement de Sanche Pansa, that was the first of a long series of theatrical adaptation of the episode of the island of Barataria. Indeed, Sancho's government and other episodes of the second part inspired numerous plays in all Europe. Spectacle for the fairs, for example, in Paris at the Foire Saint-Germain and the Foire Saint-Laurent. Comedies by Dufresne, 1694, Dancourt, 1712. Operas, for example, the two operas composed in 1727 and 1733 by Antonio Caldara for the court of Vienna, Don Quixote in Corte de la Duquesa, and Sancho Panza, Governatore dell'Isola Barataria, and plays for puppets, like the Alvida do Grandi Don Quixote de la Mancha, written by Antonio José da Silva for the theater of the Beer Walt in Lisbon in 1733. The first chronogeography of Cervantes Don Quixote between 1605 and the mid 18th century can teach us 
an important methodological lesson. The circulation of a text, thanks to its edition, translation, or theatrical adaptation, must always be considered as a permanent reinvention of the work itself. Literary geography does not map the, so, the, spatial, the spatial distribution of a stable textual entity. It maps the mobile reconfiguration of the work appropriated. The challenge consequently is to understand how publishers, translators, playwrights, engravers produced a new with quotation mark text within the constraints imposed by the work they appropriated and the genre they choose, for example, from uh, the nar narrative to the play. It seems that for the playwright of the 17th and 18th century, the book written by Cervantes was first and foremost a repertory of novellas, short stories that could be easily transformed into plots for the theater with or without the presence of the errant knight. It was the case with the novel of El Corioso Impertinente, three, chap three chapter in the first part of Don Quixote, used as a secondary plot in Middleton's The Second Maiden Tragedy as early as 1611. Or it was the case wha with what I called the novella of Cardenio. But conversely, the festivals, whatever their nature may be, aristocratic, popular, religious, and the series of illustration put into the book, which began with a Dutch translation published in Dordrecht in 1657, privileged the characters, the episodes of Don Quixote's adventure and misadventures, whereas, by contrast, they generally ignore the protagonists or scenes of the novels inserted within the Historia. As we have acknowledged at the beginning, Franco Moretti's definition of textual geography has a second meaning related to the spaces within the text themselves. In his Novelas Ejemplares, published in 1613, Cervantes inscribed in his uh, short stories multiple forms of mobility implying various geographies, commercial exchanges crossing Castile, migration of people from the north of Spain traveling south, south in search of work, returns of the new wealthy people from America, the Peruleros who came back from Peru. The main geography of the novelas, for example, in the uh, generous lover, or in the English Spanish girl, is, however, the geography that follows the captures, escapes, or rescues of Christian prisoners sent by the Turks to the Banyos prison in Algiers or on the Ottoman galley. In the first part of Don Quixote, the chapter 39 to 41, recounts also the history of a Christian captive. Seized during the 1571 famous battle of Lepanto, he was sent to Constantinople. He rose the galleys in the navy of the Grand Turk, and fin finally, he found himself in Algiers, I quote, locked in a prison or house that the Turks call a banyo, where they hold Christian captives. He is thus an imagined double, resembling yet different from Cervantes, who was also captured by Turkish corsairs, but off the Catalan coast in 1575, and found himself in Algiers, from which he repeatedly attempted to escape. But where he has the captive in the uh, Don Quixote triumphed in his endeavor, accompanied by the beautiful and already Christian Zoraida, Cervantes only regained his liberty upon being ransomed by the tri Trinitarian friars five years after his 
capture. As we can see, the entire Iberian and Mediterranean geography gives a fabric upon which are embroidered the motive of the Quixotic adventure and the motive of the exemplary novel. Such geography associated in Cervantes' life the Mediterranean world and America. In a memoir written on May 5, 1590, Cervantes requested an office either in fiscal or financial administration in Nueva Granada, Cartagena de las Indias, or La Paz, or in a court in Guatemala. In spite of his 22 years of military campaign and in spite of his wound at the Battle of Lepanto, El Consejo de las Indias turned down his request with the indication, busque por acá que se le haga merced. Looks out to make him a favor by here. In Don Quixote, and in this chapter of, uh, of the uh, captive who escaped the Banos of Ar Algiers, in Don Quixote, the brother of this captive were more lucky. After the father gave them an equal share of his fortune, Ruy Perez de Viedma, the older brother and the uh, uh, escaped captive, said that his desire, I quote, was to follow the profession of arms and in that way serve God and his king. He did it in taking part in the glorious battle of Lepanto. The second brother chose to go to the Indies and became a rich man in Peru. The youngest brother, Juan Perez de Viedma, quote, said he wanted to enter the church and complete the studies he has begun at Salamanca. He became a judge and he meets his older brother when he's going to Sevilla for leaving to New Spain, I quote, to serve as a judge, a hoidor, and the Royal High Court of Mexico. The successful Viedma family is an inverted mirror of Cervantes' failed aspirations. For him, the colony and the metropolis remain forever separated. But if his 1590 solicitation had been received, perhaps he would have never composed other work than the Galatea published in 1585. And in this case, this presentation itself will not exist. It is with this last and posthumous book, Los Trabajo de Persile y Sirismunda, published in Madrid in 1617, that Cervantes' work winded its textual geography. The two first part of this Historia Septentrional, Northern East story, locates multiple shipwrecks, journeys, adventure in a Northern world, both genuine and imaginary, characterized by furious oceans, frozen seas, barbarous islands, human sacrifices, and lycanthropy. It is with its support that this Hellenistic novel written by Cervantes, who wanted to compete with Eliodorus at Tiopica or with Lope de Vega, El Peregrino in su patria, became meridional. The heroes arrive in Lisbon, there's a change of clothing and become pilgrims who go, who go, to, go, to, go to Rome, granting a plenary indulgence for all the pilgrims visiting four basilica in the city. Cervantes, Elastic novel enclosed in its textual microcosm the wild and imagined ocean of the septentrion, Norway, Greenland, uh, Island, Iceland, the Iberian and Italian lands ruled by the Spanish king, the territories of his French enemy, and finally, the most sacred place of the Christendom. Without any map in the book, Cervantes' romance is a superb example of the power of words for producing geographical ekphrasis. Its fascinating abstraction is proved by the immediate success of the book. In the same year, 1618, two competing French translations of the Persiles 
were published, one by François de Rosset, the other one by Vital de Didier. In 1619, on the right of the screen, the first English translation of the work appeared as the travels of Persiles and Sigismunda, a Northern history. The Italian translation came out in Venice in 1626. Geography of the books. Geography in the books. Can we link these two perspectives? Perhaps if we pay attention to a phenomenon forgotten by Moretti, the presence of maps in the book themselves. It is true that until the end of the 18th century, none of the edition of Don Quixote, the exemplary novel, or the trial of Persiles had a map, or at least a printed map. In the 10th chapter of the third book of the Persiles, the pilgrims reach, I quote, a place neither very small nor very large, very large, whose name I don't recall, said the narrator, echoing the first sentence of Don Quixote. In the midst of the town square, a lot of people is gathered, I quote, all attentively watching and listening to two young men who, dressed in the clothes of recently ransomed captives, were explaining the picture painted on a canvas um pintado lienzo, they had spread out on the ground. On the canvas is painted the city of Algiers, its little arbor, and the galley on which the two young men claim to have been captives. The description of the canvas given by one of the freed captives combines the two categories of ecrasis. Ecrasis as description of an object or a work of art, and ecrasis as a narration of the story depicted in the object. The power of word is so strong that can it make useless the presence of illustrations or maps in the books. When the work, words are considered as able to produce in the reader's mind the presence of places, events, character, there is no need of actual images. In 1780, however, Joaquin Ibarra decided to insert a map of the three Jonas, of the three Salidas, of the uh, Hidalgo, Don Quixote La Mancha, in his edition of Don Quixote, imprinted in Madrid for the Real Academia de Espana. This map, and you see it, was not the first one that was introduced into a fictional narrative. Previously, three kinds of maps have been associated with novels or utopia. First, maps of allegorical topographies showing location and itineraries between sentiments and feelings, as in the case of the Carte de Tendre, inserted in the first edition of Scudery's novel, Clélie, Histoire Romaine, published in Paris in 1654. Second, maps of imaginary territories held as the places for utopia, as in the case of Moore's Utopia in 1516, or the places of dystopia, the nightmare of the utopia turned upside down. As for Joseph Holt's Mundus Alter et Eden, published in Latin in 1605 and in English in 1607. Or finally, maps of imaginary islands situated on maps of real lands, as it was the case in the 1726 edition of Gulliver's Travels. As the difference of these allegorical or imaginary cartographies, Don Quixote's map located the journeys of a fictional character on the actual map of a real land, as it was the case previously with the map of the world in which is delineated the voyages of Robinson Crusoe added to the fourth edition of the novel 
in 1719. The 1780 map, and we can we'll come back to it, was inserted in the deluxe quarto format edition of the text established by Vincente de los Rios. It was presented as a map of a part of the Kingdom of Spain that contains the lands where traveled Don Quixote and the places of his adventure. The edition, including the map, was republished two years later in a cheaper octavo edition, and it is edition we have uh, at the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania. The edition printed for the Real Academia insisted on the exactness of the map established by Thomas Lopez, the geographer of the king, on the basis of the observation made on the ground by Jose de Hermosilla, who was a captain in the Royal Corps of Engineers. The 35 places located on the map were following the chronology of the history as it was established by the editor, Vincente de los Rios, who supposed that Don Quixote was a modern hero, a hero moderno, a contemporary of Cervantes, a contemporary of the readers, and that made his three journeys or three salidas between July and December 1604. The uh, uh, comparison between the map and the chronology allowed Vincente de los Rios to correct Cervantes' narration. In chapter 9 to 11 of the second part, Cervantes said wrongly, say uh, 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 Vincente de los Rios, that the adventure occurred in the area of the Toboso. Uh, uh, he said that the adventure occurred in the area of the Toboso happened when the hero and his squire were going north, where, yes, this adventure supposed an itinerary in a contrary direction. As it is demonstrated, says a commentary by uh, Vincente de los Rios, by the itinerary indicated on the map between the numbers 17 and 22. In his commentary of chapter 29, Vincente de los Rio stressed that, I quote, it was not possible that Rocinante and Sancho's donkey could have made such a distance in such a short time. Here Cervantes made a big geographical mistake. The editor established a meticulous list of all Cervantes' geographical errors, anachronisms against the chronology of the fiction itself, negligence and lacks of very similitudes. Cervantes' error and carelessness are exposed by the comparison between the distance measured on the map and the time allowed by the book for the journeys between one place and another. Actual geography provides thus the criteria for checking the accuracy and frequently the inaccuracy of the fiction. A second map of Don Quixote's salidas, salis, travels, engraved by Manuel Antonio Rodriguez, was inserted in Juan Antonio Pellicer's edition, printed in 1798 in Madrid by the printer Gabriel Sancha. And here, here I'd just, like to just like to pause briefly to um, ap apologize for the, not for the imperfect quality of the image, but hopefully to illustrate um, a point about this uh, map and most of the others um, that you can see if you look up at the left corner, this is a folded engraving, a uh, really large engraved plate that uh, was folded and inserted into the uh, five volume edition of this uh, of this publication. Uh, the 1780 map was also folded and inserted. So you can um, get a sense of uh, the reader's experience um, in sort of being able to unfold this large map and, and actually sit it next to um, 
sit it next to the text itself. You can also see the hand coloring here. And if you were very observant, um, a slight red line also on the 1780 map, um, we're pretty sure those hand coloring uh, traces, which are important, uh, would have been added in the printing shop and they're present in most of the copies that we have seen of these maps. Um, so it is a, an additional feature added to the printed uh, engraving, but very necessary for understanding its meaning. The edition of 1798 did not attempt to correct Cervantes' mistake. It presented, however, the map of Don Quixote's travels as based on, I quote, the historical observation made by the editor, Juan Antonio Pellicer, who was librarian of the King, member of the Royal Academy of History. Pellicer abandoned the criticism of Cervantes' chronology because, I quote, we must consider his chronology not as the one of an historian who respects with exactness and reason the order of times, but as one of a poet who used to invert and disrupt it, as did Virgil with Dido and Aeneas. In the same manner, Cervantes' geography cannot be exact because, I quote, from a poet and author of chivalric fables, we must not expect a rigorous respect of geographical laws imposed on the historian and chronicler of two facts. Consequently, Pellicer's observations are not correction of Cervantes' mistakes, but erudite notes based on published chronicles and archival documents kept in the library of the Royal Academy and of the Academy of History, among them frequently used by Sergio uh, Pellicer, the Relaciones Topográficas, this uh, vast uh, inquiry about uh, the palm tree um, ordered by uh, Philip II at the end, in the end of the 16th century. The erudite observation allowed Pellicer to feel the silences of the narration. For example, a long historical notice about the three towns of Cariñera, Cosuenda, and Encina Corba is presented as a manner for feeling, I quote, a long lack of action and a long silence in Cervantes' narration, as if finally the editor was writing in the blanks of the book. Pellicer proposed also hypotheses when the history, I quote, does not give any precision as for example in the second part about the way of crossing of the Ebro by the uh, errant knight. And he desired also to identify the places of the text. For him, the palace of the dukes in the second part is very likely the palace of Buena, Buena Villa, belonging to the dukes of Villahermosa. I quote, all converse for conjecturing that Don Quixote's host were this close. The presence of genuine maps in a fictional narrative reinforced what Borges called the partial enchantments of Don Quixote, enchantments that aim to confuse the world of the text and the world of the reader. The reader is invited by the maps to become a fellow traveler of Don Quixote and Sancho and to experience with them the winding of their horizon from the Campo de Montiel and the Sierra Morena in the first part here, the lines uh, in red uh, the, at the bottom, to the Kingdom of Aragon, Catalonia, and Barcelona in the second part. The power of the maps on the imagination is such that even when the reader is convinced that the illusion of the fiction cannot be judged according chronological and geographical criteria, as Pellicer was. Nonetheless, the temptation to inscribe and measure on a map of Spain the actual journeys of a fictional Hidalgo remained very strong. It is perhaps the reason why the presence of a map of Don Quixote's travel, the three Sallies, became common 
in 19th century edition of the novel. The 1780 map was used in new edition of Jarvis translation published in London in 1801, in, a, in an edition of the Spanish text published in Berlin in 1805, and in the Didos edition in Spanish printed in Paris in 1827 and 1832. The 1798 map was a model for the Bossange and the Masson edition of the Spanish text in 1814. For the Parisian Desoer edition in 1821, adorned with a map where the landscape is made visible by a form of a chiaroscurist rendering, offer a map established by Bory de Saint Vincent, military naturalist for a new translation by Henri Bouchon du Borgnal, the first French translation published in 1822. The same division between the model given by the map of 1780 and the map uh, of 1798 is, exists in the two first edition of the Spanish text printed in America in 1836 in Boston. The edition uh, followed the Boston edition and the uh, 1798 map, whereas in Mexico in 1842, the Mexican edition retook the 1780 map. How to conclude? Perhaps by paying attention to another geography, another cartography forgotten by Moretti, not the cartography of the circulation of the books themselves, not the cartography of the journeys made by fictional characters, but the cartography of the travel of the author himself. In 1880, Manuel de Foronda published in Madrid a book devoted to Cervantes Viajero. The map included in the book showed the various travels of Cervantes in Spain, in Italy as a soldier, his journey on the Mediterranean Sea with its participation in the Battle of Lepanto and its capture near the Balear Island indicated by a small cross and his captivity in Algiers. On the map also, you have the your return from Algiers to uh, uh, Spain and uh, uh, this uh, possible, not absolutely certain journey with his company in the island of the Azores and Terceras in the Atlantic. And finally, the last two missions in North Africa. Thanks to the power of Ekphrasis, or to the presence of actual maps, Don Quixote Salis, Persiles Pilgrimages, and Cervantes journeys, all were connected history, connected history in a global world. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful series of lectures. As John mentioned before, um, we have been longtime colleagues and it is a joy to be able to work together as even under these extraordinary circumstances. On behalf of Rare Book School, I would like to thank you and um, Roger Chartier and John Pollock for this fascinating series on textual transmission and the cultural impact of the works of Bartolome de las Casas, Cervantes, and others on the Western world during the early modern period. Um, my name is Camille Davis. I am the program's associate here. Um, I will be co-moderating this session along with my colleague, Laura Item. So if you have any questions at this time, please feel free to enter them into the chat. We're going to start off with another time, long time um, colleague of ours, Christine Schott, who first starts out like this. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, you discussed this energetic use and reuse of Quixote in festivals, public events, and on the stage. Do you have a specific term for the reuse of this material? The only concept she can apply to it is intertextuality, but that doesn't seem specific enough. 
we are perhaps uh, seeing or listen to uh, uh, um, I, I use frequently the uh, category of uh, uh, appropriation that is to say uh, to do something new with something you receive or you uh, 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 boost look for and so this idea of the uh, uh, the, the appropriation, of course, uh, because uh, it avoid the, the, what is more or less a, a, a difficulty with intertextuality. Intertextuality first could be effective like uh, intertextuality when a text is uh, using, incorporating uh, other, uh, other text. Uh, but uh, the first limit uh, we have seen often with John of this definition of intertextuality is the fact that uh, you forget what is another form of intertextuality, the material intertextuality, when different, we have seen this yesterday, when different uh, texts composed uh, uh, as such are put together in the same book, either because the uh, publisher wants uh, to uh, uh, put together different texts and uh, it could be uh, checked if you have uh, a, a continuous series of signatures, but also in many cases, uh, because a reader wanted to have different texts put together in the same binding, and uh, here start the question of why, and what was the meaning given to each of these texts by the presence of other texts in the same book. But it could be idiosyncratic. It could be just in one book, uh, desired by one reader, and to make this kind of portable library or kind of anthology of text that he or she thought uh, were uh, uh, possible to uh, put together. So intertextuality could have this first uh, limit. And of course, when we are talking about the uh, embodiment of the character of a fiction in a festival, or uh, when we are uh, talking about the presence of an engraving or a woodcut in a, in a book, uh, or when we are uh, talking about uh, the performance on the uh, stage, uh, of course, it's more than uh, intertextuality. First, because the uh, medium can change. Uh, images are, are not text, uh, and uh, the performance on the stage is not reducible to only the uh, text which is uh, uh, delivered. Uh, and so we have, to, of course, to try to invent a new form of uh, the designation of this migration, mobility, uh, appropriation of a work uh, in its different uh, instantiation, in a sense. But I, uh, I thank, thank you for the question because it, uh, it, it's a challenge to, uh, to, to think uh, uh, in a new way this uh, form of uh, uh, migration of text uh, from one language to another one, from one genre, uh, narrative to another, uh, uh, a play, or uh, uh, in the case of many Shakespearean play from a chronicle to uh, 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 theater and so on. So personally, I use frequently, but not with a absolutely strict the conceptual control, uh, the uh, concept of uh, uh, mobility, uh, uh, migration, appropriation. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Karen, who asks, is it possible that the inclusion of maps indicates that editors thought readers needed help following the plot, particularly non-Spanish readers of translations? I think so. I think there is a, a different uh, function attributed to these maps. Uh, one was to blur the difference between the world of the text and the world of the reader, uh, because the world of the map is the world of the reader, and it's an uh, actual world and uh, in uh, authentic maps. But there is also another uh, more intratextual function that is to say, as John has shown, you have uh, 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 35 places uh, named uh, in the 1780, 82 map and 45 in the 1798. And it could be considered as a form of index of the text. Uh, yeah, you can go from the text to the map, but you can also go from the map to the text. And uh, yeah, because in the uh, uh, cartouche, 
you have the uh, reference to the episode uh, corresponding to the uh, to the place. It's a little uh, when, when we have seen yesterday in this uh, uh, map for Las Casas, in which an image could was referred to different uh, pages, and it worked like an index. Uh, yeah, and it could be a, a possibility of uh, users. And I read recently uh, an article about the fact that uh, uh, some of the English travelers in Spain in the 18th and 19th century uh, yeah, did not follow, as uh, we can do now, the, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the road of uh, Don Quixote, but can use uh, in the form of a dialogue the uh, guides for the travel and the, the map of uh, uh, Don Quixote and the different places, particularly the most famous places, the uh, uh, cave of uh, Montesinos or uh, the uh, beach uh, of uh, Barcelona or the uh, 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 Campo de Montiel and so on. So I think there are also uh, uh, attention for the presence of the map between uh, uh, elements uh, which uh, are uh, connected with an external use or reference to the text and also uh, intratextual uh, uh, references. And it's a, perhaps a reason of the, the success, not only in the 19th century of the maps in many editions of uh, uh, Don Quixote, where he has in the early modern period, it's only in the 1780s that uh, this device appeared in the edition, but also that in many books of the uh, uh, 19th century and 20th century and 21st century, we have uh, uh, often maps uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning, uh, the, uh, the, more, the more contemporary uh, literature uh, uh, can show many examples of, uh, uh, of this. How interesting. Thank you so much for that. Our next question comes from Jane, who asks, um, would you please clarify if translations in so many languages, especially in the 19th century, originated from the original Spanish? And then Jane says, thank you. I love the series. <laughs> thank you very much. But, uh... I have not the answer for all these translations because I have, I have not studied uh, in the 19th century. Of course, when you have this multiplication, we have the map by Moretti showing this. Uh, it would be a fundamental issue to look at the uh, text translated. Uh, we know since the example I gave that the translation of translation was a common practice in the uh, early modern period. Uh, and uh, could remain a, a, a practice when we are dealing with uh, the language of the different empires, particularly Habsburg or uh, uh, Russian, and some of the edition uh, in the uh, in Asia. But I have no other knowledge for this. But it would be the uh, a fundamental issue, as we have seen uh, often in 20th century, a book translated from English when they were already at English translation of another uh, uh, language. So it's a uh, yeah, it's a fundamental issue. This, and uh, I think it was interesting to, to to discuss the geography of translation. But we can add to this project by Franco Moretti. Uh, two main elements, so first element to consider that the translation with or without quotation mark are not only uh, the uh, migration of a text from one language to another, but could be this uh, multiple uh, appropriation we have mentioned. And secondly, that uh, uh, the uh, question of the uh, all text translated is a fundamental uh, uh, issues. Uh, I, I, the, the only example I have uh, not studied because I don't know Russian, but uh, I knew I know what this example of uh, uh, four Russian translation of Don Quixote between the late 18th century and the beginning of the uh, 19th century, three were based on a French translation. Only one in the 1830s appear to be based on the uh, Spanish text. I imagine that in many uh, cases uh, beyond Russian, this phenomenon existed. 
All right, thank you. Our next question comes from C. Fisher, who asks, would Cervantes' own journey around Andalusia, Andalusia uh, requisitioning oil and grain from, for the Armada of 1588 be a starting point for analysis, textual or spatial, of the novel? Yeah, but it's a, it's a question of the relationship between uh, Cervantes' life and uh, the, the uh, Cervantes text, particularly Don Quixote, but also some of the uh, uh, exemplary uh, uh, novels, or even some of the uh, part of uh, Persiles. Uh, it's an interesting uh, 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 issue, uh, uh, because uh, uh, on the one hand, what it is said there, here, that is the moment when uh, Cervantes was working as a collector for taxes, uh, yeah, or uh, for, uh, as it was said rightly, uh, constituting uh, your resources for the uh, expedition. Uh, was a difficult moment, and when uh, he was uh, uh, he was put in, in jail in a certain moment, a uh, uh, complex uh, issue about the irregularity of this operation. And some people attribute at this period uh, uh, of time the first, uh, the beginning of the writing of uh, uh, Don Quixote. Secondly, it's sure that uh, 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 the experiences of Cervantes uh, are more present in his work than for many other of the author contemporary of Cervantes. There was a, a famous sentence by Francisco Rico, the great editor and uh, the scholar of Cervantes, saying that uh, the Quixote is written perhaps for the first time for uh, uh, a narrative. Uh, 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 in the uh, domestic prose of everyday life, and not according to uh, style, the style of the chivalric novel, the style of the pastoral novel, the style even of the picaresque novel. And so this uh, uh, immediacy of a way of writing as people were uh, uh, talking, which not it's not uh, with, without uh, literary which quotation mark work because you cannot uh, make this directly. But nevertheless, the fact that the linguistic matrix of the Quixote was this domestic prose of everyday life created a possibility, another possibility, not only of articulation between the text and the life, but also uh, production of a reality effect, the production of this enchantment in which the, the frontier between the text and uh, 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 the reader are uh, 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 blurry. And so this is another dimension of this, uh, of this question. The last one would be also uh, the fact that uh, in the 18th century uh, uh, was perceived this possible relationship between the life and the work in a period in which it was not common and uh, uh, you, you have some life of a writer who were written, but generally uh, they were not intricated with the work. They were like in Vasari, the uh, 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 Italian painters uh, in anthology or dictionary or, uh, of Italian painters. Uh, you have uh, uh, the life, uh, uh, the journal of Cursus Sonorum, and you have the work. What was a, a new model in the 18th century was to consider as a question that the life has an effect on what was written and in what was written, you can perhaps perceive the uh, uh, experiences of the, uh, of the life. And the case of Cervantes was the more immediately open to this paradigm. And the first life of Cervantes by uh, Mayan Sisiscar in the 17, uh, for, uh, in the 1740s, London edition by Thompson, a magnificent uh, edition. The life of Cervantes was playing with this uh, relationship and it was new. Uh, you cannot have the, uh, the same kind of uh, uh, intrication or uh, uh, encounter between the experiences, the suffering or the happiness of the life and the works uh, for other authors. So, this dimension of the bio, uh, and l the last one could be also, uh, Jean Canavaggio showed this, that there are a kind of uh, 
disguised autobiography in various uh, chapter of Don Quixote or in the uh, uh, in the uh, exemplary novel. And for example, this question of the uh, capture and uh, 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 prison in Algiers. It was an obsessive topic. Never Cervantes put directly what happened to him, but either in the narrative of the captive, uh, another form of novel in the Don Quixote, or in the uh, 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 the, uh, Span the English, uh, 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 La Española Inglesa, there are display with uh, his own life. Sometimes it's uh, about the duration. He was a captive during five years. In the Española Inglesa, the captive is only one year. Uh, in the case of Don Quixote, the captive escaped, and he tried five times to escape, but he was uh, he failed, and so he was just uh, uh, redeemed by the uh, Trinitarian friars. Now, there is a play, and it's also rare, very rare. There are few authors who are uh, uh, putting in the 16th, 17th, uh, 18th century their life element of their life, even if they are displaced, reframed, uh, uh, reinterpreted within the work itself. So in this sense, there is some exceptionality of uh, uh, Cervantes in relation with the topic of uh, the experience of the life and uh, the aesthetics of the work. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from Osima, who starts like this. Once again, thank you for a fabulous presentation. In addition to the maps, could the idea to illustrate certain scenes of the texts, despite of or in addition to the descriptions themselves, be aimed at those who did not read or knew little of letters? In that case, there was a real need to include illustrations. Thank yeah. you. It's an immense problem, that is to say, the, I have no expertise for this. The illustration in the, uh, in the text, uh, in the different edition of uh, uh, Don Quixote. Uh, first, because it, uh, it also started late. Uh, the image we have shown, uh, we drawn of the frontispiece of 1618 French and 1620 uh, uh, English edition given as 1612 uh, with the two characters, uh, uh, the windmill uh, uh, was the only image in the uh, edition until the first series, which curiously appeared uh, in the Dutch translation in 1650s uh, 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 in uh, Dordrecht and after. Of course, there was uh, the multiplication of the uh, images and illustration, and it's an uh, immense work, work, field of work. First, because uh, this uh, series of illustrations could be the reflect of different dominant aesthetics, and uh, uh, some could be uh, linked to other forms of image of about uh, this uh, uh, Don Quixote, for example, tapestries or a series of paintings. Uh, and so here you have uh, uh, a certain style, a French style, if I can say. Other series are uh, uh, entering uh, uh, into uh, uh, the uh, books uh, with uh, uh, different uh, uh, aesthetics. But the question is interesting because what we forgot also, and I forgot in this lecture, was the fact that in the 18th century, Don Quixote circulated massively in form of abbreviated editions. That is to say, uh, uh, in chapbooks. And in this case, was a series of drastic uh, reduction. Uh, we have a series at the at University of Pennsylvania, and like, in the book on uh, Cardenio, I tried to do something with this, but uh, it would be an entire topic to see the uh, 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 users of an immense uh, two volumes uh, 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 history uh, for uh, the chapbook edition, in which very crude and simplified image with uh, accompanied uh, very uh, reduced and abbreviated uh, uh, text. And this is another uh, uh, 
uh, difficulty because uh, uh, when we say your people have read Don Quixote or even people have read Pamela, what did they read? If they, uh, they have read the uh, uh, entire uh, first and second part, or even by choosing some chapter, or did they have in the hand one or another of this multiple abbreviated edition, and particularly numerous in the case of France, of England. Uh, and so this is uh, the rest uh, the, a fundamental issue for all these uh, books, which are impressive in their uh, dimension, but which were also transformed by the, uh, uh, the abbreviated edition Everyone knows the case of Pamela, the epistolary novel transformed into very short uh, narratives uh, in the format of uh, uh, radically abbreviated and reconstructed edition. And in this, uh, in this sense, it's another form of this mobility or migration of the, uh, of the text. Uh, in this case, a profound alteration of the text that it was given in uh, its first uh, uh, edition, but also the uh, opening of the circulation of the story, if not the uh, text, to a wider readership. And uh, uh, in the, 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 always the repertoire of the chapbooks books have incorporated abbreviated form of the uh, classical or canonical uh, uh, text. Since the uh, 17th century until, of course, still more in the uh, uh, 19th century. And in this case, we see that uh, the relation between the text and image, I will try to discuss this last time, uh, acquire, acquire a new dimension, that is to say uh, the dimension of uh, uh, making possible the understanding of the text by people who don't read very easily or uh, who are uh, listening to someone reading out loud the uh, abbreviated text of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the novel uh, and in, in it seems to me yes it's an important uh, uh, question i have forgotten in this talk but but it was important to think about the uh, abbreviated Don Quixote, and in 20th and, uh, century, it would become something absolutely essential when Don Quixote, particularly in Spain, entered uh, in, the, in the schools. And uh, there was, uh, in the 20th century, uh, some rule in the Spanish pedagogy that obliged every master of uh, primary uh, school to read at the beginning of the day a part of a chapter of Don Quixote. And of course, in a form of a abbreviated for the school uh, edition of the, uh, of the text. Well, uh, yeah, it's an, a very important question. And uh, again, to be faithful to uh, Mackenzie, uh, uh, the uh, new form of a text are uh, creating uh, a new text and uh, opening to uh, a new readership. And, and just to add one small thing, I, um, and to recall our first lecture quickly, there's one set of images we didn't have time to talk about, but we could even talk about the modern ongoing uh, engagement with the text through new translations and new illustrations, Quechua in 2005, for example, or artistic works, William Steig, uh, in the 1960s, as well as the earlier uh, image tradition. So just thought I'd sneak in one, one set of images we, which are well beyond the scope of what we could do today. Um, but it's a great question. Yeah, because what is also specific in this case is the fact that uh, I think it's the first time that the character of a fiction were uh, gouging outside of the page of the fiction. Mm. Uh, uh, after it would be followed, as I said, by the 18th century, uh, uh, commodification of the novel from uh, uh, Richardson to Rousseau or Bernardin Saint-Pierre or Goethe. But before, I think there is no comparable example. Even if you think about Gargantua, Pantagruel, they are at, just at the uh, conversely, 
they are because they are figure of the carnivalesque culture that Rabelais appropriate them into a, a text. But in the case of uh, Don Quixote, uh, uh, there are, in all the uh, circumstances we mentioned, this uh, possibility to, uh, to, to, to a, a, a life of the character in outside, separated from their textual life in Cervantes' domestic prose. I have one example here, of course, with these uh, uh, images of the uh, stereotype of the uh, errant knight and the uh, uh, gordo, uh, Sancho Panza. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, so I think that was uh, our last question. Unfortunately, we've gone a little bit over time, but I'd like to thank both of our speakers for what was a wonderful series, um, just brilliant and fascinating. Um, so I'd also like to thank our RBS audience for staying with us um, through these three lecture series. If you would like more lecture series like this, please, um, go to our website, um, rbsrarebookschool.org slash um, RBS online. You, you will be able to find everything, all of our offerings there. Um, and once again, thank you so much for this. It was a joy. Thank you for your thank great you. questions. Have a good day. Uh, <laughs> Everyone stay well. Thank you thank so much. Thank you.